Amen. So keep your place there in Galatians uh, chapter 1. We're going to start there in just a minute. So we're starting a new sermon series uh, this evening. So we'll go um, for uh, four or five weeks um, on this sermon series. And the title of the sermon series is called Damnable Heresies. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 1, the Bible reads, it's on the inside of your bulletin, you know, keep your place in Galatians chapter 1. I'll just read this for you. It says, there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, a lot of people will um, kind of, you know, play down, you know, the doctrines of the Bible, especially verses like this. There's a lot of um, compromise out in Christianity, and I, I use that, that term loosely today, that, you know, anybody that claims the name of Jesus, anybody that claims Christ, is uh, saved, you know, is good, and that's good enough. You know, these are the, the Billy Grahams and all these people that people, I mean, that, that's not even a good example. He said people can not even claim Christ and still go to heaven. But the point is, is that people will, you know, kind of criticize us for following the Bible, saying that, oh, you're drawing too strict of lines and all these things. But look at what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2. It says that there's damnable heresies. That means that there's teachings out there that are sending people to hell, is what that means. And it's interesting in Galatians chapter 1, where Paul is talking about his gospel. He's talking about his gospel. I love verse number 12, where he basically says, For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ himself taught Paul the gospel. And Paul then up in verse number 8 and verse number 9 says to everybody that, hey, if anybody brings another gospel to you other than the one I brought to you, the one that I got from Jesus, you know, let them be accursed. He says twice. When the Bible repeats something right after the verse that it just repeated, it's basically he's saying, if anybody teaches another gospel, let them be damned. Let them go to hell is what he is saying. So it's a big deal. These heresies, these damnable heresies, are teachings by Christians today that are going to send people to hell. It's a big deal. They're causing people to not be saved. And in a very subtle way, and tonight we're going to look at a very, a very wicked doctrine that's out there today, and it's called Lordship Salvation. It's called Lordship Salvation. It is mainly pushed today by a man named John MacArthur, who has a large ministry actually in California, in L.A. And you say, what is Lordship Salvation? You can lose your place in Galatians chapter 1. Go to John chapter, Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. I want to give just a really quick up, or just a really quick recap for two minutes on Jonah chapter 3 and verse number 10. Soul winners need to know this verse, and they need to understand how to explain this verse. Let me read from you, I'll read a quote from John MacArthur on Lordship Salvation. John MacArthur, whose book, The Gospel According to Jesus, lays out the case for Lordship Salvation. He summarizes the teaching this way, quote, The gospel call to faith presupposes that sinners must repent of their sin and yield to Christ's authority. So real quick, go to Jonah chapter 3, Jonah chapter 3, and let's take a look at this idea um, that he's talking about as far as repent of your sin. Um, this is, first of all, you can't, even, you can't even hardly use the word repent today without people, you know, misunderstanding what it, what it says. We always let the Bible, you know, define words for us, but the word repent has literally had its meaning changed. If you look up repent in the in the dictionary it says repent of your sin first of all how can you or turn from your sin you can't define a word using the word first of all but second of all what does repent actually mean he's saying that the gospel call to faith presupposes that sinners must repent of their sin and yield to Christ's authority look at Jonah chapter 3 and verse number 10 many people believe that you must repent of your sin to be saved all right and this lordship salvation doctrine is a cousin to repent of your sin salvation. But look at Jonah chapter 3 and verse number 10. So what happened in Nineveh, we just studied this, is Jonah went and pre preached in Nineveh, and surprisingly, the people listened. The people actually listened to the prophet for once in the Bible. They listened to the man of God. Now look at verse number 10. It says, And God saw their works, 
that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them and he did it not. So there's two things that you need to take away from this verse right here. Is that repenting of your sins, meaning turning from your sins, that's what people believe, repent of your sins. That's what John MacArthur is talking about. He's talking about turning from your sins. That is works. Turning from your evil way is works. God saw their works. What were their works? That they turned from their evil way. That's works. Look, it's good. It's a good work. It's a good work to turn from your evil way, but it's works. And the second thing is this. God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. God repented. God does not have sin. So every time you hear the word repent, in Mark 1.15, repent ye and believe the gospel, every time you hear the word repent in the Bible, all it means is to change your mind. It means, I mean, did God sin? Nobody would agree that God sins. God has no sin. I've studied this out. God repented many times in the Old Testament. The, the person that repents the most in the Old Testament is God. And God does not sin. So repent does not equal repent of your sin or turn from your sin. It simply means repent ye and believe the gospel means change your mind from whatever you believed to what the gospel is saying. I literally said that to a guy several times today. I don't use the word repent, but I, I literally say to somebody when I'm giving them the gospel, do you see how that's different from what you told me at the beginning? I'll very clearly say to them, well, I'm going to show you how the Bible says something different from what you told me. And I'll point out, when I get through this in the Bible, I'll point out where the Bible does show that difference. And then when I get to the point of that difference, I will say, do you see how that's different? You have, do you, have you changed your mind about that? And they will say, yeah, I, I do see the difference. And I, I have changed my mind about that. Why? Because it's right there in the Bible. What have they done? They've repented. They've repented in what? Believed the truth. Believed the word of God. All right? So... Repenting of your sin is works. So if you have to repent of your sin to be saved, that's a works-based gospel right there. And those people that are teaching that, the Bible says, let them be accursed. It says, let them be damned. So now there's nine tenets of lordship salvation. I'm not going to go through all nine. I picked out the kind of the four or five that are the main ones. You're going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of read off these tenets to you, and then I'm going to show you this is, this is, a typi this is typical of these damnable heresies, is that they, they're, they're, single ver they're one verse wonders. They, they have one single verse, and they, they leave out the context of you know, the entire chapter of the verse. Many times, here's another Bible reading rule. Bible reading rule number one is if you're interpreting a verse that contradicts, that makes it contradict clear scripture, in the Bible, you're interpreting it wrong. It's your mistake, not the Bible's. The second one is this. Many times you can dispel these one verse wonders by simply reading a few verses above and a few verses below and getting the context of what the Bible is talking about. Many of these verses are not even talking about salvation. You know, people just applying, you know, verses that are not talking about salvation to salvation. All right, so the first tenet that we're going to talk about tonight is I'm going to read you the verse that they use to prove it, and then we'll actually look at what it means, okay? The first one is this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you're going to go to verse number 15, but the first tenet is this. True faith, we're looking at tenets of lordship salvation, okay? True faith always produces a changed life. Now, this is a, these statements are from, you know, the, the grace church, whatever it is uh, that John MacArthur runs, these are his words, their words, not mine. All right? So true faith always produces a changed life. Now, you got to start to recognize some of these words that they use as well. So when someone says to you things like true faith, things like, you know, things like this, you can kind of start to tell, okay, I, I think I probably know what they believe. I think I probably know what I need to d dispel with this person that I'm talking to. This will make you a better soul winner. But notice how it says true faith, meaning there's always this question of whether or not it's really true faith or not. All right. So the comment or the, the statement is this true faith always produces a changed life. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 15. This is how they prove it right here. 
And you'll just see, like, it's just, it's maddening. Like, there's just a complete misunderstanding of salvation, complete misunderstanding of the Bible, but it makes perfect sense because these people aren't saved. We'll get to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 15. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, be, are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So, that is true. You are a new creature once you are saved. Turn to John chapter 3. Look, you're literally born again when you are, um, when you are saved. Look at John chapter 3. Go to John chapter 3. Now let's just explore what that actually means, that you are a new creature. So if you're saved tonight, if you trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a new creature. The moment that you got saved, you became a new creature. Look at John chapter 3. Look at verse number 3. This is Jesus talking to Nicodemus. And Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, there's that new creature, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now Nicodemus doesn't understand what Jesus is talking about. He thinks Jesus, this is kind of like John MacArthur here, he thinks Jesus is talking about like literally physically being born again. Like just talking about the, the idea of just a man, a grown man being born again. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's clearly thinking about this idea of being physically born again. And Jesus answered, and Jesus explains it to him. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus, and then people will use this to, to say that you have to be baptized to be saved too. But he's talking about, there's two births that Jesus is talking about. He's talking about a spiritual birth and a physical birth. So you've been born once, that's your physical birth, that's the, the birth of water. That's what Jesus is talking about. He's saying, except a man be born of water, that's your first physical birth as a baby. And of the Spirit. So this second born again is a spiritual birth. Let's keep reading. Jesus makes it even more clear. Here's proof that it's two births. It's not like you're born physically, you're born by believing on Jesus, and then you're baptized and you're born. It's, uh, it, that makes no sense. He says, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So if you just match up the flesh birth to the water in the verse above, and the spirit birth to the new birth, the, the spirit birth, literally, it makes perfect sense. And he says, marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. The wind, and then he just goes on. But the point is, this is such a typical case of people listening to Jesus and not understanding that he's talking about spiritual things and not physical things. Like, I am that bread of life. What? We're supposed to eat Jesus? The Catholics still believe that. He's talking about spiritual rebirth here. So, the point I'm trying to get you to understand is that you are spiritually a new creature once you are saved. You are spiritually born again. Now go to Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5. Go to Titus chapter 3 and look at verse number 5. Titus chapter 3, look at verse number 5. Actually, let's go back to verse number 4. It says, But after that the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. This is talking about salvation. By what? The washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So you are spiritually changed. You are spiritually made alive when you got born again. But let me tell you something, folks, and if anybody else has had this experience different than mine, please let me know. But when I got saved, I didn't all of a sudden like become young again and get, you know, I'm still getting gray hair. I'm still got this flesh. I've still got this, this old man upon me here. I mean, my flesh did not change and neither did yours. You had some things happen to you. You were spiritually made alive. You are no longer under sin. You are no longer a slave to sin. We'll look at that in just a few minutes. But you didn't get physically changed. Anybody can see this. All right? Here's the second one. Turn to Romans chapter 6. 
So this idea that, you know, all of a sudden I'm just going to become this new physical person that no longer sins anymore once I get saved is complete false doctrine. Look at Romans chapter 6. Look at verse number 17. Here's the next one. True faith means that Jesus will be the Lord of your life. Again, we see that true faith, real faith means that Jesus will be the Lord of your life. And they use Romans chapter 6, verse number 17, which is just crazy because Romans chapter 6, as I showed you this morning, is nothing but Paul taught. Well, I'll, I'll show you in just a minute. But let's look at Romans chapter 6 and verse number 17. This is the verse that they use to say that Jesus will be the Lord of your life, meaning everything that you do will be according to what Jesus wants you to do once you are saved. Look at verse number 17. But God be thanked that you were the servant, you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered, which was delivered you. I mean, I can prove this doctrine wrong with the, the, the verse that they, they call out. What does it say? Turn to Romans chapter 10. Look at, oh, underline these words if you write in your Bible. You obeyed what? It says, they have, ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. What does that mean? What does that mean? He's saying, you were servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart. Turn to Romans chapter 10 and verse number 9. It doesn't say you obeyed with the flesh. It says you obeyed with the heart. So what do you do with the heart? You know, what is the heart used for? Look at Romans chapter 10 and verse number 9. I mean, this is what we literally tell people at the very end of giving them the gospel. In verse number 9, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe where? In thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It is the belief in your heart. You trust on Jesus in your heart. Not with your flesh. That's what it is saying in Romans chapter 6, 17, where it says they obeyed in their heart. Not, not with their flesh, not with their actions. For And then in verse number 10, it literally explains it to you. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Obeying from the heart, it, Paul is talking about you've, you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ with your heart. Look at Romans chapter 6 again and go back just a few verses. This is one where you can just go back a few verses. You don't even have to go back a few verses, but if you know what, what, um, what, you, what you do with your heart, you know, if you're saved, you know what you do with your heart. You believe unto righteousness with your heart, Romans chapter 10 says, just a couple chapters over. Look at verse number 15. Just to get some context of what Paul is talking about here, we talked about it a little bit this morning. And again, he says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. He's literally saying, like, hey, don't, don't keep sinning just because you can. <laughs> that's, that's what he's saying. If Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. What Paul is saying here is that when you believed with your heart, when you got saved, you became free from sin. What does that mean? Does that mean you're never going to sin anymore? No. That means that sin can't kill you anymore. That means that sin can't destroy your soul in hell anymore. So, Paul is saying, why would you willingly go and serve sin? Why would you willingly go? It's like, it's like you're in this, this fight with sin, and sin showed up, you know, now that you're saved, sin shows up with a knife to the gunfight. That's what Paul's saying. He's like, you got a gun, and sin has a knife. Like, they're, the, they're, they're literally showed up to a, a, a gunfight with a knife. And you're like, why would you ever serve sin? Paul's trying to convince you, like, hey, you're no longer a servant to this anymore. This sin can't endanger you anymore. It can't kill you. It can't kill your soul anymore. It can't send you to hell. Why would you be a servant to it? You would have to willingly go and put yourself under servitude. You'd have to take your gun and, you know, put it in your back pocket and just willingly serve sin. Willingly serve the guy that showed up with a knife. 
That's what Paul's saying. Why would you do this? Saying, look, he's not saying you couldn't do it. That's why he keeps saying, you shall, you should, you should, you should, again and again and again in Romans chapter 6 and Romans chapter 7. He's just saying, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this. He's trying to make the case for why you should actually like constrain your flesh after salvation. Verse 19, he says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, which you still have, by the way. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now, now that you're saved, yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. He's talking about sanctification after salvation, getting right. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Look at Romans chapter 7, just one chapter over. Look at verse number 4. Romans chapter 7, one chapter over, he gives an analogy he gives an analogy of a, of a wife married to a husband and how, you know, the wife is bound by the law to her husband, but if her husband dies, he's, he's making an analogy of, of how we are free from sin as this wife would be free from her husband. Let's just read the whole thing. Look at verse 1. It says, Know ye not, for I speak as them that know the law, how the law hath dominion over a man as long as he live. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. He's making a comparison here. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. It's just talking about a woman whose husband has died. You know, she is no longer tied to that husband, she can go, a widow can remarry. As a matter of fact, the Bible says widows under 60 should remarry. But then he's using this as a comparison. Wherefore, he's saying, in the same manner, my brethren, you're also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So just as that woman is free from the law of her husband as her husband died, you are dead to the law, meaning the law can't kill you anymore that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we what? We should bring forth fruit unto God. He said, you should do this. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. That sin, before we were saved, literally was bringing forth fruit, bringing forth our spiritual death. That's why you were spiritually going to die before you were saved, folks, is because of that sin. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead we're in, we were held, that we should serve, should serve in newness of what? In what? Newness, newness of what? What is that word? What was born again? Newness of spirit. That we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. You know what he's saying? He's saying that your flesh, you should make your flesh match the newness of spirit. It's like now that you're saved, don't go serve the sin. You're not dead to the sin. You're not held to that. But you should serve in newness of spirit. Follow the spirit is what he is saying. And we'll talk about the spirit in just a few minutes. Why in the world, if all of a sudden we just didn't struggle with sin anymore. If I was truly saved and I no longer struggled with sin and I just got all the sin out of my life, why in the world in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 would Paul have to say, as we talked about um, just, I don't know, two or three weeks ago on self-control, where he said, you know, I, I keep under my body, I bring it into subjection. I mean, he's talking about exactly what he's talking about in Romans 7, 6 right here. He's saying, I'm constraining my flesh to match my spirit, my born-again spirit. That's what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He's saying, we need to constrain that. We need to keep, we need to keep, we need to control ourselves. You know, this flesh is not brand new. This flesh still has the lusts and the desires of this world and all these, all this sin that, you know, the, the spirit is telling us that we should be away from. We need to keep under our body, keep control of our body and subdue it. So it matches the born-again spirit. Turn to Romans chapter 4. So, I mean, we're looking at this true faith. True faith will produce, you know, a, a changed life. That's, that's the statement. Or, or it, you will make Jesus the Lord of your life. It will produce this changed life. Look at Romans chapter 4 and verse number 4. 
kind of blows this one out of the water, or this one kind of blows this out of the water. It says, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. This is another very strong soul winning verse here. He's talking about two people in verse number four and verse number five. They're, they're in verse number four, there's someone that worketh. He does good works. He's out there and he's going to church and he's doing what he's supposed to do, but the reward is not of grace, but of debt. I always tell people about soul winning, you know, people that think that, you know, I think if I'm pretty good, I can get to heaven. And then I just give them a simple analogy that, you know, I point at their car in the driveway and I say, what if I stole your car? What if I stole your car and then I took your car on a joyride and I smashed it up and I lit it on fire and then the Fresno PD arrested me and I stood in front of a judge in Fresno and I said, and the judge said, Pastor Jared, did you steal and destroy Bob's car? And I said, well, judge, yeah, I did. But you know what? I'm really nice. And everyone always laughs. Whenever I say, for years and years and years, whenever I say to somebody, do you think the judge is going to let me go? Most of the time they laugh out loud. And I've never had one person say, yeah, I think because you're nice, they should just let you go. I've never had one person say that. Because they know that no matter how nice I am, I have to pay for the crime that I committed. That's what the Bible is saying in verse number four. It doesn't matter how nice this guy is. He's going to have debt because he has sin. But to him that worketh not, verse number five, this, is, this blows lordship salvation right out of the water right here. He worketh not. He has not made Jesus the Lord of his life. He is not doing what he is supposed to do. But what does he do? He believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. The jerk is going to heaven and the nice guy is going to hell in verse number four and five of Romans chapter four. It blows it completely out of the water. Number three, turn to 1 John chapter 2. You're going to keep your place in 1 John chapter 2 because the Lordship Salvation proponents completely destroy 1 John chapter 2. They misuse almost every single verse in this chapter. But the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse number 3, well, here's the, let me give you the next, the next statement. And this one is really tricky. Let me give you the next statement. Here's the next statement. Obedience is evidence one's faith is real or genuine, they will say. And you know what? You might almost listen to that one and say, eh, eh, that doesn't sound that bad. But here's what you, what you need to understand. You need to understand that they're constantly putting doubt in this real faith or true faith. It says obedience. Let me read it to you again. And then let me tell you how I would reword it, and then I would agree with the statement. But it says, obedience is evidence one's faith is real. Now, if that said this, I might agree. Obedience is evidence of one's faith. I would agree with that statement. But they're constantly getting people to question whether or not their faith is real or not. So they say obedience is evidence one's faith is real. Look at 1 John chapter 2. This is what they use to justify this. And it's a complete misunderstanding of the Bible. It says, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 3 says, And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He saith, I know him. He that saith, sorry, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. They're basically saying that unless you keep all the commandments, you're not saved. Like, nobody's going to heaven in this religion here. We're all going to hell in, in, in this, this religion. Anybody that doesn't keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in. This is not a salvation verse, is the truth of it. So what we need to understand here, it's talking about we do know that we know him if what? So we know Jesus if what? if we keep his commandments. You know what that tells me? That tells me that knowing Jesus is a spectrum. It tells me that, that you could have two saved people and one of the saved people might know Jesus better than the other saved person. Is that not true? Who, what is Jesus? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is sitting in front of all of you. This is Jesus. How many of you know this perfectly? How many of you know every single word in the Bible and can quote any verse that I throw out right now? Nobody, including myself. I guess we're not saved. 
Knowing Jesus. It, it, first of all, what's the important thing about salvation? Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Is it important? What is the important thing about salvation? Is it that we know Jesus? What does it mean to know Jesus? Look at verse number 7 and look at verse, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 7, look at verse number 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 21, the Bible says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. So these are red words if you have a red letter Bible. Meaning Jesus himself is saying not everybody that claims the name of Christ is going to heaven. So where are those lines drawn? Well, we draw them with the Bible. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. These people know Jesus. They know Jesus. They're calling him Lord. But Jesus himself is saying, not everyone that calls me Lord is going to go to heaven. What? How could that be possible? Look what he says. As a matter of fact, it's going to be a thing that's not uncommon. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and thy name cast out devils, and thy name done many wonderful works? What are these people doing? These people are standing in front of Jesus, and they are calling him Lord. I'm sure they believe he's the Son of God. And they're standing in front of him, and they're professing what? They're professing their wonderful works to him. And what will, that, what will, that, what will Jesus say? I'll profess unto them, oh, look at this. Is, is knowing him what was important? He will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These people that are going to stand in front of Jesus, and they knew he was the Son of God, and they knew he was Jesus, and they stood in front of him, and they're professing their works to him. Jesus said, it doesn't say he used to know him. He didn't say, oh yeah, I knew you, and then I forgot you, and then I knew you again. He says, no, I never knew you. What's important for salvation is that Jesus knows us. And how does he know you? Because you're not trusting in your works. You're trusting on him alone. And then he knows you. And then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Man, if, look at 1 John chapter 2. I'm sorry, did I, did I keep your, have you keep your place there? We're going to keep going back there for the rest of the sermon. But it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable that they could take these verses and just make these drastic statements. Salvation is whether or not Jesus knows us. And knowing Jesus is keeping his commandments. So knowing Jesus, how well, look, we should know Jesus. We should study the Bible, listen to the Bible, follow the Bible, put the Bible into action in our lives. But that will be a spectrum in different Christians' lives, at different levels of growth with different people in their lives. Obviously, somebody that's been saved for 10 years and been in church and been soul winning will, be, will know Jesus much better than somebody that just got saved yesterday and has never read a page in the Bible. But both are equally saved. Look at verse number 5 of 1 John chapter 2. It says, but whoso keepeth his word, again, it's about you know, doing what Jesus wants you to do. In him verily is the love of God, and I love this word right here, perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. Talking about the spectrum of perfect faith versus dead faith. Talking about James chapter 2 again. Talking about those two people. That, you know, one person that doesn't have works in their life as a saved believer, their faith is on the dead end of the spectrum. And then you have somebody that has works along with their faith. Verse number 18, show me thy, you know, thy faith without works and I'll show you my faith by my works. That guy's got the, the faith on the perfect end of the spectrum. But look, folks, there's nobody with completely dead faith with zero works and nobody with completely perfect faith. It, God is just trying to get you to understand that to perfect your faith you should have works that go with it. I mean, wouldn't you want to have stronger faith? Perfect faith? Here's the next one. Here's the next one. And this one's uh, especially wicked. They all are. But turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And you kind of start to see the, the, the manipulative you know, tone of this doctrine here, hopefully. But... This, the, the fourth one I want to talk about is this idea that if you're truly saved or you have true faith, you will persevere in the faith. And this is the, this is the thing that's, that's irritating about this one. And even as a Lutheran, I thought this was how Baptists were, but Baptists are not this way. I, was, I, was mis, I misunderstood that. But they will look at somebody that is backslidden and falls out of church and, and gets back into sin, 
in their life and they will say, yeah, that person, see, they'll claim to believe in eternal security. But they'll just look at somebody like that and they'll say, yeah, they were never saved in the first place. Yeah, that person was just, they were just never saved. That wasn't true faith that they had. Their faith wasn't real. This is incredibly damaging to people, this type of doctrine. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 8. This is what they use to justify this doctrine. It says, Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to Isaiah chapter 61. So they'll take that one verse and they'll say, See, you will, you will not go back into sin for the rest of your life. You're, you're like, what in the world? How are we blameless? How are we blameless? Look at Isaiah chapter 61 and verse number 10. Isaiah chapter 61, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, I will, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. We are only righteous in the eyes of God because of the robe of righteousness that Jesus Christ provides for us. God does not look on you and say, oh, that guy's righteous. No, he looks on you and he sees the blood of Christ. And that's how you are righteous. We are literally wearing a robe that God gave us when we trusted on Jesus Christ. It is not our righteousness. I mean, this is something. And if you even read the few verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 before verse number 8, it's literally talking about what God does for us. Not talking about us like you know, being perfect all the way to the end of our Christian life. Look at verse number four. He says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ. What, what God's doing for us. That in everything you're enriched by what? Is this talking about Christians like doing, uh, living a perfect life? That we're enriched by him in all utterance. It's saying, how, do we, how are we uttering things that, you know, Say, he's enriching us by his word. When we go out and we go soul winning, we don't say, hey, let me explain to you in my own words the gospel. No, we use the utterance that God has given us. We use the word of God. And in all knowledge, where do we get all knowledge? From the word of God. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, talking about this church that's going out and they're doing what God wants them to do. So that you become behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're blameless by, by Christ, by him clothing us in righteousness. I mean, this whole passage is talking about what God does for us, not about us persevering to the end. Go to 1 John chapter 2. Here's another verse that they use to talk about how we will just persevere to the end no matter what. 1 John chapter 2, look at verse number 19. And this is a huge misunderstanding of this verse as well, because this verse is actually talking about something very specific that we will all deal with in a church. Look at verse number 19 of 1 John chapter 2. This is what they say. Uh, this is a, a verse that they use to, to say that if you are truly saved, if you have true faith, if your faith is real, you will persevere to the end, meaning you will not backslide out of the Christian life. Look at verse 19. They went out from, uh, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. First of all, again, not a salvation verse. This is not talking about salvation. This is talking about, I mean, turn to Luke chapter 12. Turn to Luke chapter 12. Let's look at what this is actually talking about. This is talking about something very serious that is actually going to happen, you know, in a church, especially a church that is out soul winning, doing what God wants us to do, you know, bearing fruit in this Christian life. Look at Luke chapter 12 in verse number two. So the Bible here is saying is that there were people that were amongst them, but were not really of them. Amen. And it's saying at the last part of this verse that they went out and they might, that they might be made manifest. It's saying that they were, they were put out, and they were now, they're now not amongst them anymore because God made it known. 
Look at Luke chapter 12 and verse number 2. Jesus himself confirms this. Luke chapter 12, verse 2. He says, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear closets shall be proclaimed amongst the housetops. It's exactly what 1 John chapter 2 is talking about, is that these people that were amongst us, look, we've dealt with this here. There were people amongst us, but they were not of us. He's saying, it's not a salvation verse, folks. It's just warning. It's just warning that there could be false prophets that come in here. There could be false prophets that will come into a church and try to teach damnable heresies. And you need to watch out for that. That's what the Bible is saying. That's what Jesus is talking about. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Je Jesus literally says this. He says, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, he says, Beware of false prophets, which will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So you say, what kind of people would, would come into a church and, 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 and they're, they're not of us? Well, the first type of people is false prophets. People that are literally just like, they look like, they look like, they talk like, you know, believers, but they're just false prophets. They're just... They're, they're wolves. They're here to just devour. They're here to destroy the church. That's the first thing. There's going to be false prophets. But look, even on, on the side of, um, outside of the false prophets, there's going to be people that come into the church and just try to do harm. People that come in and just act badly. But what does God promise us in 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 19? He promises that it will be made known. He promises, look, it'll be made known that they're not all of us. And look, I'm thankful for that promise. And I've seen that promise come true from the Bible. When there's bad things happening in the church and bad people in the church, God will make it known. And look, I don't even care at that point if there's some kind of destructive force in the church. Well, were they saved or unsaved? Or, at, the, at the point where there's a destructive force in the church trying to destroy a soul-winning church, I don't care. It's like there, it's going to be made manifest, and, and we'll put people out of the church, as the Bible tells us to do. But 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 19 is not a salvation verse. It's a warning to a church. And so let me warn you. Let me warn you. As, as soul winners, as you start to become a soul winner, your life will change. Why? Because Satan's after you now. Because you have a target on your back now. Why? Because you're being fruitful now. Because as you become a soldier in this army and you start, you know, literally taking names for Christ, you have a target on your back now. A soul winning church will always have a target on its back. This is why 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 19, Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 15, Luke chapter 12, verse number 2 and 3, this is why Jesus says this stuff. This is what he's doing. He's warning us. He said, hey, it's not going to just be peaches and cream everywhere you go. He's like, when you start actually becoming fruitful, becoming a soul winner, preaching the gospel, doing what you're supposed to do, things are going to change. The devil's going to attack you. The devil's going to attack the church. But hey, you, you prosecute things the way I say, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We have these promises. Here's another uh, phrase. This is the last one we'll look at. So we know that it's not about whether we know Jesus to be saved, it's about whether Jesus knows us. And if we've trusted on Jesus, he knows us. Here's the next phrase, the last one we'll look at. Those who truly believe in Christ will love him. You're going to start to see that there's kind of a common thread with all these, all these statements. Those who truly believe in Christ will love him. What that's saying is, you know, you will love Christ and he will become the Lord of your life if you truly have believed, if you are truly saved, if you have that real faith, you will be saved. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 8, is what they use here. 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse number 8, is what they use here. In verse number 8, the Bible says, Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom now though ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith even to the salvation of of your soul, your soul. So if you're looking at verse number 80, this is what they use. Whom having not seen ye love. Peter's gr uh, greeting a, a, a church here. He's, he's writing a letter. 
<laughs> he's, he's writing a letter to a bunch of believers that are serving the Lord, and he's saying you love the Lord. He's not saying that you know every single person that is saved will be loving Jesus. I mean, what does it even mean to love God? In John chapter 14, again, it's a spectrum. How much do you love God? Well, in John chapter 14, in verse number 15, it, there's a really complicated verse here where it says it defines what it means to love God. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Does anyone have perfect love for God? No. I mean, is there anybody that is just, has, raise your hand if you have reached sinless perfection in your life. You will never get there. Should we be getting sin out of our life? Should we be following the commands? Yes. That is how we show love towards God. But we are saved because he first loved us, the Bible. That's why we're saved. And we should love him back. Romans chapter 8, they use this one too. Go to Romans chapter 8, which is, makes no sense, but okay. Let's read it anyway. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, they use this one to say that those who are saved will love him. Complete misunderstanding of Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28. Romans 8, 28 is one of the most misunderstood promises in the Bible. This is a promise to saved people that are doing what God wants them to do. So there's two things here. You're saved and you're doing what God wants you to do. And ye know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Look, if you're saved, you're, be, you're called to the purpose of, of becoming conformed to Christ. You are called to learn the Bible, get sin out of your life, follow these commandments, and love God. But this promise is to people that are actually doing it. This is a very... This is an awesome promise in the Bible for people that, I mean, if I, think about it, if I had some problem in my life, if I had some problem in my life that I was trying to solve, that, that was something was, was, was plaguing me, or something was going wrong in my life, you know what the first thing that I would do? Because look, this is a promise in Romans 8, 28. The first thing I would do is, is show God that I love him. The first thing that I would do is I would get everything right that I needed to get right. I would start serving the Lord. I would start soul winning. I start being free to thrive. I start like showing God that I love him because that's what this promise is for, is for believers that are, that are showing that they love God. And it's not some feeling. God, I mean, I'm glad that love to God is not some feeling that he had towards us. No, when God loved us, he sent his son to pay for our sins. In the most brutal death you could possibly think of, he spent three days and three nights in hell and rose again from the dead, and all we have to do is trust on that and we're saved. I'm glad that that's what God looks at as love towards us. So what God is saying here, hey, all things, I got some problems in my life. I got, I got some messes going on. I want some prayers answered. You know what I do? Show that you love God. Get things right. Get the garbage out of your life. Get separated. Get in the word of God. Show God that you love him, and he promises you. It'll work out. This is a great promise. And it's just completely wrecked by this, you know, they totally just twist it up with this, this crazy doctrine. But it's a promise to those that are actually doing what God wants them to do. It's one of the benefits of following Christ in this life, folks. So look, at the end of the day, there's only two religions in the world. There's salvation as a free gift through trusting only in Jesus, and then there's works-based salvation. This is just another veiled works-based salvation. It's a cousin to repent of your sins, and it's way worse, in my opinion, than Catholicism. Because Catholicism is like straight up like, hey, you got to do the works. And it's like so easy to just prove that from the Bible and get people to see that they need to repent from that belief to the, to the true gospel. But this is a, a, a very bad heresy because people, it reminds me of Lutheranism in many ways, because people that believe in this heresy, they are as unsaved as the Catholic. But they will tell you that it's by faith alone. And so it is, it is many times it is hard to wrap, unwrap people that are in this heresy. It's, it's hard to get them, they're, they're wrapped around the axle. It's It's tough. To get them off because they're like, oh, I believe it's, it's faith alone. But you have to do the works. <laughs> and 
As a matter of fact, I hope, and I hope you kind of started to see this with these statements, but I really, I mean, turn to 1 John chapter 5. I really, I truly feel sorry for people in this church in LA, in, in John MacArthur's church. I, I mean, I feel sorry for these people because I have met people like this, but the main thing that you need to understand about this doctrine is you could never really know that you're saved. And you will see this with people like this. The Bible is very clear, folks, that you can know that you're going to heaven. I mean, it is not complicated. Look at verse 13 of 1 John chapter 5. I truly do feel sorry for and, and have compassion towards the people that are caught up in this heresy. Because it is, it is confusion. It is confusion, and many times it's such deep confusion that it is hard to get them back to the truth. Look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. And they can never know. They're living, in, in, they're living in terror. These things have I written unto you that what? That believe on the name of the Son of God. He's saying, what does it take? What does it take to be saved? To believe on the name of the Son of God. He, he, he's like, I'm saying this to you, save people. Why? That you may know that you have eternal life. Is it, that you may think that you, you should have eternal life. He's like, no, I'm telling you this so you may know that you have eternal life. You could never know. You could never know if you believe this doctrine. I mean, think about it. You get backslidden. You struggle with sin. I guess you were never saved. I mean, this is where, I mean, where is the list? Here's the thing. If this was true, if this doctrine was true, the Bible is incomplete. Where's the list in the Bible? Because I don't think John MacArthur would believe that you could become sinless. So where's the list in the Bible of how many sins per week I can commit, of what type, how many times I have to go to church to cover up those sins? I mean, where's the list to where I can stay saved? Or where I was, it, it was really true faith or real salvation. There is no list because it's not of works. That's why there's no list. If, if, it's, if it's a little bit of works and, and Lordship salvation is true, the Bible is missing information. I need charts. I need graphs. I need severity of sin over time. You're like, you're overthinking. No, because the Bible says I can know. So if this is true, I need charts and graphs. But this is not true. This is a damnable heresy. This is why you will see people that are in church for 20 years. And they're like, oh, I was never saved. This is why you'll see that. You'll see people that are in church for 20 years getting re-saved. They're coming up and saying, I just got saved. And I've been in church for 20 years. It's a mind cult. It's, it's a leader holding people's salvation ransom. Is exactly what it is. It's a power play. It's sick. To sit here and, and like, look, constantly getting people to doubt their salvation? You don't like this sermon? This sermon isn't resonating with you? You saved, brother? Are you even saved? Well, you went back to, to, to those sins that you used to do and you're, you're not coming to church anymore? Like, hmm, was that true faith that you had? It's wicked as hell. I'll stand up here and I will scream every verse of the Bible at you and you may walk away some days thinking, jerk face, why do you have to bring that up? But I can never take away your salvation because you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, not pastor. I want you to get right. You should show that you love God. You should follow the Bible. So should I. But if you have trusted on Jesus, you are saved, and nobody can hold that over your head. It's trust in Christ plus nothing, minus nothing. And, I mean, look, it's, it's confusion. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 that God is not the author of confusion. Anything tying works to salvation is a false gospel, period. Here's what really bothers me about it, though. They attack soul winning, and they attack the true gospel. And this is what really gets me about it. They will call the gospel, just by trusting on Jesus, they will call it, they'll come up with, with uh, you know, uh, derogatory terms like easy believism. 
and oh, you're just uh, one, two, three, pray after me. Look, let me tell you something about our soul winning program here. We have a seminar uh, that's on YouTube, and, and we will train you to go soul winning. We are thorough soul winners at this church. When this church started, there's several people that are not, not here anymore, but there's kind of a culture when this satellite ministry started where we had a couple people that were like, hey, I just want to stick my foot in the door and I want to make people repeat a prayer so I can tell people that I got somebody to repeat a prayer. That will never happen here. We are out to preach the thorough gospel to people, get them to change their mind about what they believe and get saved. We're not out there to just pray a prayer with people. You'll meet people that have been confused by people like that. Oh, I, I've prayed. They don't know what they believe. They believe in all kinds of different things. They believe in works-based salvation. They don't even know if, there's, if God is real. And they're like, oh, well, some guy prayed with me one time. That is, we will never be that church. We are thorough soul winners here. We spend hours and hours and hours on, on a soul winning seminar that you all came to. And, and it's, it's all about preaching the true full gospel to people so they understand it. But you know what? I do believe in easy believism because it's easy to believe. <laughs> it's, easy to, it's easy to get a gift. Salvation is a gift. In John 6, John, Jesus compares it to eating a piece of bread. In John chapter 10, he compares it to walking through a door. It's easy. As long as you have the heart to receive it, it's easy. I mean, it's simply a choice to trust or not to trust. To trust yourself or to trust Christ. Because it's easy because all the work has already been done. That's why it's so easy. But they attack the gospel. They, they play down the gospel. And guess what? They don't go soul winning. Well, thank God they don't go soul winning. But they don't go soul winning. And they, they attack people that are out actually trying to get people saved. You know, there's all kinds of logical problems with it, too. It basically, it takes away free will from people. It takes away the idea of free will. It means like, you know, all of a sudden I get saved. And all of a sudden I'm just this, if I'm really saved, I'm going to be this robot that just does what I'm supposed to do for the rest of my life. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Look, folks, you do get some tools when you get saved. God doesn't just renew your spirit and just leave you alone. You get some tools when you get saved. But you still have to, you know, subdue your body and bring yourself under submission because you still have the flesh. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 11. This lordship salvation, it takes away the idea. I mean, it's works-based salvation. But look, God doesn't expect us to be illogical. You know that? You know, part of our conscience was our ability to reason. That's why God says he'll reason with us. You know, if you find somebody teaching something that you're just like, yeah, that just, that just doesn't sound right. That just doesn't make sense. God is not the author of confusion. The, the gospel and, and the truth of the Bible, it matches our conscience and it matches our reason that God gave us. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 11. God does give us tools, though. It says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. This is talking about, you know, what we inherit when, I talked about this at the Red Hot Preaching Conference, we, what we inherit when we get saved, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. We are pre you have a destiny if you are saved. Whether you fulfill that is, is up to you. But you do have a, a destiny that's predestined in that we should that we should be to the praise of his glory. There's that word again. It keeps coming up. Who first trusted in Christ. In whom also ye trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. How do I know that believe on means to trust? It's this verse right here. I don't read this to people out soul winning many times, but I do explain that believe on means to trust. And look, it's, it's in verse 13. Whom also ye trusted after ye heard the word of truth. What's the word of truth? The gospel of your salvation, in whom also that ye believed, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Which is the, now this is it, this is what you get when you get saved. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. The Bible is saying here that when you get saved, God, after you trust on, on the gospel, you trust on Jesus, and you get saved, God seals you with the Holy Spirit, which is what? It's a down payment he puts in you. He puts the Holy Spirit in you. 
like you would put an earnest payment down on a house, an earnest payment. He's saying, I put enough Holy Spirit in you to seal you until the day of redemption. It's a great eternal security verse right here. John MacArthur is teaching people that their works are sealing. John MacArthur is teaching them that people, that their works are what is keeping them conformed. He's teaching that your works replace the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is how you are saved eternally. It is the mechanical way that God does it. He literally gives you. Now go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. He literally gives you. So if you're saved and you're backslidden and you're back into all the sins you used to do, you still have that Holy Spirit with you. How do I know? Because the Bible tells me. And guess what? You're going to know too. You're going to know. Why? How are you going to know? Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And it's interesting because Ephesians chapter 4, they use that uh, a couple times to, you know, they twist this one around. But Ephesians chapter 4, if you just read the whole context of Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to point you to verse number 30, but let's back up a few verses. We're talking about the Holy Spirit that's sealing you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 30. Let's go back to, go, go to verse 23. Let's get crazy and actually read some Bible verses here. It says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. After that, you put on the new man, after, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So now we're talking about that spirit within you. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let the sun go, not, not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give him, that may, he may have to give him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication. He's saying, here's the thing, the things that you should do once you're saved. He's like, get all this. He's talking to these, he's talking to these Gentiles in Ephesus. He's like, hey, all this garbage that you used to do, he's like, get this stuff out. He's like, follow the new man. Follow the spirit that's been reborn in you. Look at verse 28. Or 29, let no corrupt communication. He's like, quit speaking the way you speak. He's like, you people speak disgusting. He's like, you're saved now. Match the new man. That which is good to the use of edifying. He's like, hey, start speaking the Bible. Start speaking doctrines. Start speaking in the church. Like, start speaking in the church things that edify your brothers. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. Because what happens if I don't do these things? He says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. If I'm just going to automatically just do whatever, how could I possibly grieve the Holy Spirit? It's possible to not do these things, keep speaking corrupt communication, keep stealing, keep doing all these things that are not according to the new man within you. And you know what? You're going to grieve the Holy Spirit. And you know what? You're going to feel that grieving. And there's some Christians that are pretty good at grieving the Holy Spirit. They're pretty good at just like, la, 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 not listening to the Holy Spirit at all. Why would that verse be in there if I was for sure going to conform? If I was truly saved? It makes no sense, folks. It's just, it's illogical. It's illogical. It's anti-biblical. And you could never know that you were saved. And I mean, I'm glad the Bible gives us verses like this. Turn to Psalm chapter 51. Because if you think about, well, man, what kind of sins would, would cause me to lose my salvation? I would think that murder would be up there. I would think that adultery would be up there as far as sins that could cause me to, like, where, or to where I was never really saved in the first place. Look at Psalm chapter 51. You open up your Bible right in the middle. You'll be in the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 51. Psalm chapter 51. David himself goes into adultery. He goes into adultery and he ends up killing a, a, one of his mighty men, a good, righteous man, Uriah. I mean, how long was this whole thing from the first time David lays eye, laid eyes on Bathsheba to the time that he killed Uriah to the time where Nathan the prophet came and called him out on his sin? How long was that? And you would think, you know, the John MacArthur's would be sitting there looking at David during that time being like, oh man, that wasn't true faith. Because if murder and adultery don't get you there, what does get you there? But look at Psalm chapter 51. David gets right. So I guess he gets born again again. 
But that's not what happens. Look at verse number, uh, verse number 10 of, of Psalm 51. The Bible says, David is now getting right. Nathan has called him out. He's repent. He's, he's asked for forgiveness. He's trying to get right with God. He's confessed his sins. And he says to God, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He's like, help me to get right. Cast me not away from my presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. What he's talking about here is, is, being, is the equivalent of being filled with the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. That's a whole sermon in itself. But he's not talking about don't take away my salvation. As a matter of fact, he makes this clear in verse 12 where he says, restore unto me to, uh, my salvation. And he says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. David gets right and he says, God, help me to appreciate my salvation. He doesn't say, God, help me be saved again. He says, Lord, just restore unto me the joy, the appreciation, the thankfulness of my salvation. Help me not to trample on Christ. Because that's what we're doing. When we go out and we willingly sin, that's what David did. He trampled on Christ. You say, Christ hadn't come yet. He trampled on the future Messiah that would pay for his sins. Hebrews talks about this. If we go out and we willingly sin, we are crucifying Christ afresh. We are disrespecting the sacrifice that God gave us. He's, not, he's going to punish us for that in Hebrews 12. He's not going to take away our salvation. But we need to ask, and David asked for the joy of our salvation. This lordship salvation makes salvation purely subjective to whoever is preaching it. It is a damnable heresy. John MacArthur is sending people to hell. He's unsaved, and anybody that believes this is not saved. And I pray that we could reach people and get these people saved. Because, look, it's a terrifying doctrine. It's a terrifying doctrine. People are afraid. They could never know. It's illogical. It's anti-biblical. And it's a damnable heresy. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Bible. I thank you for the, the clearness of the Bible, Lord. I thank you for um, just all the doctrine that you've given us. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've given us, Lord. It helps us to understand, you know, these words in the Bible, Lord. I, I just, I thank you for the opportunity. I pray, Lord, for people that are caught up um, in this heresy, Lord, that you would just lead us to them and help us to clearly explain the gospel. The simplicity um, that is in Christ, Lord, that you, you, you tell us about in 2 Corinthians. I pray that you just lead us to these people and just uh, soften their hearts so they can know that they don't have to be terrified. Um, they can know. Uh, they can know that they're saved, and they can know they're saved, and it's easy just by trusting on your Son. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here and study your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.